Thank you all for joining us. My name is Christina Furs, and I'm a member of the Black Management Association. Um, we're very excited to continue to celebrate Women's Month um, by bringing you a phenomenal speaker today, Paula Smith. Paula was named the athletic director at UCI in 2019 and has nearly 30 years of experience in college athletic administration, 14 of those at UCI. She previously served as the executive associate athletic director, the senior associate athletic director, and the assistant athletic director for academic and student services. Paula is currently one of 40 female Div division one athletic directors nationally and the second at UCI and only one of 10 female athletic directors of color in the entire nation. Um, outside of her AD duties, Paula is also a member of the NCAA Division I Council and Competition Oversight Committee. She's also active in campus entities such as the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Intercollegiate Athletics, the Chancellor's Advisory Council, and the Campus Ethics and Compliance Risk Committee. In addition to her UCI duties, she has served on the NCAA National Collegiate Men's Volleyball Committee, as well as a liaison with the Minority Opportunity and Interest Committee with the Division I Strategic Planning Cabinet. Uh, over the past 25 years, she has served on several national panels and while serving as athletic director, UCI teams have advanced to the NCAA championships twice and claimed four regular season Big West titles, as well as several teams being ranked nationally. Let's all give a warm welcome and thank you to the very inspirational Paula Smith for joining us today. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, for uh, the welcome and the nice introduction. I really appreciate that and uh, for the invitation to join everybody today. And so, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Williams Bradford, thank you for the invitation and having me join you. Uh, it's a pleasure really to be here today and doing this. So I thought I would do a little bit of a journey um, of how obviously I got into sport and uh, whether at what point was the pivotal time for me to transition uh, into a career in intercollegiate athletics. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, hope you'll hopefully walk you through this um, journey with me. And I will try to pause occasionally so that uh, if there's any questions, um, I can fill them as we go, but I certainly will leave some time um, at the end of the presentation uh, for any uh, Q&A and questions that we have. So let's get started. Let me share my screen. Let's take a go share. Put in presentation mode here. Okay. And uh, can everybody uh, see my screen? Wonderful. Okay. So, one last thing cursor. Yep. I'm starting off with. Um, really going back to my formative years. How do you like my, my maps that I've uh, uh, provided for you? So um, I thought it, the, the quick thing that you would uh, discover from this is that I'm obviously um, a child from a military family. Uh, my dad was in the Air Force. And so um, he decided that he, he born and raised in Richmond, Virginia with my mom. Uh, and they just decided they wanted to have um, an opportunity for a better life for their children. And so my dad joined the military and, uh, and obviously began his career um, in the Air Force. And so I've lived in five uh, different states in the United States. I was born in Illinois. Um, but I did spend time in Virginia where most of my family is uh, from. Uh, I went there on a couple of occasions when my dad had to go overseas um, uh, to uh, Okinawa, Japan, and uh, so that so that I had some formative time with uh, my family back in Richmond, Virginia, before we sort of made our way um, west. Uh, I did live in Mississippi. And uh, the cute story um, that my mother loves to tell about uh, Mississippi is that I told all my friends that I was going to, to Miss Sippy's house, not necessarily Miss Sippy. So, um, so again, uh, learning, learning my states uh, as I was growing up. Um, and then we moved to Chicago, um, sorry, to Illinois. Uh, from there, I went to Colorado. And then um, from Colorado, uh, we actually went uh, out of the country and uh, we went to Germany. And that was where my dad um, stationed at Holloman Air Force Base. And for me, that particular period of time was when I really discovered um, what part of sport that I really like. And um, in that case, 
I went into cheerleading and cheerleading was not something that I really wanted to do. And so we were um, stationed at Holloman Air Force Base. That was my introduction to um, some sports there. And what I didn't like about it was that um, interestingly enough, girls had to put on uniforms and we had to have our names on our bloomers. And uh, there was a particular cheer that you had to cheer and turn around and then flip your skirt up. And that was that was my first and last um, uh, opportunity and chance in, in cheering and um, learned early on that I did not like that and it, it just didn't have sit well with me. And so interesting also is that in Germany, I played sports. And that's where I began playing sports. And the truth is, if you know the sport, you know the rules, which my dad obviously uh, taught me um, in, ter in terms of playing some of the sports, that you could make friends and extend your opportunities. Um, you didn't necessarily have to have the language um, as long as you could play the sport and make friends. And so for me, that was the introduction of my love for sport because I actually had to make friends as we moved from base to base um, and making new friends all the time. And so um, sports just became the big thing in my family and how we um, made our, our lives work and getting to know the new community that we moved to um, as as we traveled the United States. And so I thought it would share with you um, a photo of my family. And uh, obviously that's uh, me here in the middle. And uh, my, I have two sisters, um, one older sister that lives in Atlanta and a sister um, that lives here in California with me. And, uh, and then my mom and dad um, obviously is the my uh, family and growing up. And so uh, that was our, our Afro days. And then um, you can see I still sort of rocked mine uh, as, a, as a child and then my parents here in the formal wear. But um, this is my, my, my core family. And, and this is the family that I started playing sports with. I, as a, as a young daughter um, of a military family who understood uh, hard times and hard life, my parents were um, subliminal and over in their message that their daughters were gonna go to college, that we were going to find and uh, have wonderful careers and that we were gonna be, essentially be independent. And um, this is what they encouraged us to do. So I shared, I shared this next slide with you. Again, these happen to be jobs that I did while I was growing up. I worked um, at obviously the commissary um, uh, bagging groceries. And I think there's a lot of people who, who know how to do that and have worked in a, in a grocery store. Uh, and then when I went off to college, I started working for Kinney's shoe store and I thought I was going to be in business. So I thought I would work in retail. And that was one of the uh, jobs that I uh, got to afford uh, myself and college opportunities. And then I also was, um, because my dad was in the service, um, it was important for me to be able to um, type and be a clerical, um, a clerical assistant. And so I worked in the summers at um, White Sands Missile Range. And what was interesting about the, the job in the White Sands Missile Range um, was that it was um, one of the times and I worked in typing manuscripts. And so the interesting thing was to see all of the different versions of a movie that um, of their assault vehicles um, that I got to type a manuscript on. And so I did have a, a small clearance at that time to be able to work on the base and actually type the manuscripts. So I went off to college working uh, summers um, at Holloman Air, Holloman Air Force Base, as well as White Sands Missile Range and Kinney's. And I thought my career was going to be in business and sports and uh, business first. And I thought I was a manager in training. I thought this was the rate to go. My parents were in the military. My mom worked in contract and procurement. So I had sort of this interest in um, uh, transportation and distribution because we we're on an Air Force base. Um, and so I, my major in college was um, ended up being marketing with transportation and physical distribution. Um, as, right as the as a side or a minor to my my career, I did start with accounting. I will admit that, but uh, accounting was not personal enough for me. I really am built on relationships, and uh, so after the first, um, I think maybe the first semester, semester and a half, I decided that I needed to move from uh, accounting to to marketing. And so again, I I went through my career um, as my undergraduate degree, thinking I was working in. Um, a career for, for 
business. And, and I think I was leaning more towards the transportation and physical distribution sides of things. Um, the next piece for me is while I did all of this um, for getting into college, I worked for the athletic director for my undergraduate degree. And so um, the next photo I'm sharing with you happens to be what I did um, in playing sports. I um, was an avid bowler with my mom and dad and uh, on our team and, and my sisters. Then my sisters and I, we bowled together and then we separated and uh, I bowled. So I bowled for almost um, up until my senior year in high school, I played volleyball and basketball at junior varsity and varsity uh, for four years in high school. But when um, I moved on um, to college, I was not recruited. I'm about 4'11", and I say I'm five feet, but I'm really 4'11 and three quarters. So uh, I always up the ante there a little bit, um, but I was not recruited um, heavily as, as an athlete. So I knew that I had to work to go to college um, in, in college and pay for my education. And so this is just a little bit of my sport to illustrate again, I loved playing sports. I played uh, rec leagues, I played softball. Um, I just, it was something that I continued to do but not something I was thinking about in terms of a career. So I head off to New Mexico State. Um, that's my first uh, place of employment uh, at, in college and on a college campus. I thought it would be fun to work for the athletic department. I was a work study student. Uh, and so I went to the athletic director's office and I uh, applied for a job. And unbeknownst to me, my sister actually was working in the department. And so his question to me was, um, am I as good as my sister as an employee? And I said, I'm, I'm better. Didn't really have any idea because I, I wasn't sure what she was doing, but I, I made that statement pretty boldly as well. And he said, you're hired. So I ended up working for the athletic director for four years at New Mexico State while I was um, earning my undergraduate degree and, uh, and continuing to move through, um, move through, uh, marketing as my undergraduate education and planning for how I was going to start my career in business. Um, and I was applying for jobs coming out of college um, with Conoco, um, different types of oil companies and um, applying for internships, um, applying for regular jobs. Um, and that was really what I thought um, I was going to be moving into. And then my business law professor, uh, had a conversation with me about an opportunity that presented itself at the Big West Conference. And back then it was the Pacific Coast Athletic Association. But the NCAA started uh, my uh, internship for minorities and women in sport. And uh, he said, hey, you know, this, this is an interesting thing. You've always liked sports. Maybe you should consider applying for it. Um, what the heck, you know, you're coming out of college or you're applying for all sorts of jobs. This might be something that's worth um, an interest to you. So you should apply. And so I did. I applied, um, at, uh, applied for the Big West internship and I was lucky enough to get the internship. Um, here, here is a, a moment for me to consider whether or not I really wanted to go in business or whether or not uh, this opportunity for career and sports was going to manifest in a way that I would enjoy and, and love to work. So I thought about going, um, the internship opportunities I had was Big West, California, and Alaska, kind of coal oil. So um, I think me sitting here having a conversation with you today would demonstrate that I obviously um, took the sports uh, internship and, and came on out to California. Um, and, and that was um, that still at that point in time really wasn't the pivotal point for me that I, I knew that I really wanted to have a career in sports, but I had a, a wonderful opportunity to come to California and Therefore, I, I did so. Um, the Big West created a, a small, it was a small office. And so what it did and afforded me as an opportunity in a small conference office that had eight employees. So for me, getting into the intercollegiate athletics business meant that early on I had a seat at the table. Um, it was such a small office that you had to, my, my primary jobs um, was compliance and championships, but you had to, everyone had to pitch in. So you had to know a little bit, you had to be able to um, 
write some press releases. You had to do game management. You had to do uh, championships. Um, I was compliance and in. Um, compliance interpretations for NCA rules and regulations. And so I also had to be in at the table to know what was happening at the NCAA, uh, top levels and governance structure, um, all the rules and regulations around sport. And so really the big West immersed me into sports pretty quickly um, as a 22 year old. And so um, I found that it was a lot of fun and um, I enjoyed what I was doing. I obviously enjoyed what I was, um, where I was living. Um, and the conference office decided to enhance my opportunities, um, and they enrolled me in an NCAA fellows program, which was, uh, it's a presidential fellows program that help um, students uh, and employees learn the career of sport. And so you had to go to, um, at the time that was in I believe Kansas City, before the NCAA moved to uh, Indianapolis, you had to go to um, monthly sessions, classes, seminars. You had to have a mentor. You had to go to your mentor's place of business. You had to shadow them and work. And, um, and the Big West afforded me that opportunity to uh, get the uh, NCAA President's Fellows um, opportunity. And so that was a deeper um, immersion into sport, intercollegiate athletic sport on a college campus. And so um, I was fortunate to be paired with an athletic director and uh, be able to go and visit uh, his institution. And really, again, back to shadowing how things operate on, on a day-to-day -day on a college campus. In a conference office, it's really a small, tight-knit office that you don't see a lot of people or visitors because that's you know, unless it's corporate partners who are coming to, to the conference office or the membership that's coming to the conference office, you don't really see a lot of other people until you get to championships. And that was, that was, that was the moment that it was really real for me and that there were, there was more to do, um, seeing how an intercollegiate athletics department operated. I felt that I could enjoy, enjoy a career in sport. And so I worked 11 years in the big West conference office, um, there, I, I, as I said, I started in compliance, then I worked my way up to championships and then to an assistant um, commissioner of the conference. Um, and so my years, uh, formative years in the Big West um, were really built when we had football, when we had um, amazing uh, uh, collegiate basketball. If any of you have watched or, or paid attention to sport, that was the time that uh, UNLV uh, and Utah State and um, Fresno State were in the Big West Conference, and uh, UNLV was uh, the national champions of um, March Madness. Uh, I think you, Jerry Tarkanian, a lot of people would know that name. A lot of people would know the name of um, Larry Johnson, uh, Stacey Ogman, J.R. Ryder. Um, and so that was... Um, a very challenging situation and time to be actually doing compliance in the big west um, and having to do in interpretations for that particular institution because you had to be on top of your game um, they were uh, alleged to have been violating NCAA rules and regulations and so when you answered an interpretation from from that institution you had to you really had to make sure you were doing everything correctly. You had to document what you were saying uh, or the likelihood you could be at the NCAA and in, in front of enforcement. So again, as a young individual, a young professional, um, that was a really interesting and tough time to, to get started in the career. That also gave me an opportunity to do rules presentation. I had to, I get I had to go on college campuses and do rules education for all of our schools. Um, I had to stand in front of football, you know, large uh, personified football and basketball coaches, as well as all the other sport coaches um, and an institution and really go through the NCAA rules and regulations. Um, and a lot of times being peppered about um, questions of whether or not you could do or not do something and, and hold my own. And so I, I really thought that this was um, an exciting opportunity. And I thought my career might even just stop there at a conference office, but I didn't look back. This was the moment where I decided that I op actually had an opportunity to work in sports. I love sports. Um, I love watching it. 
I love playing it. And, and I recognized early on, I never looked back. I never went back to why am I not in business? Why am I not moving forward uh, back into this career of um, transportation and physical distribution procurement, um, working in, in sort of the supply chain and, and uh, demands. And so that just it just it just fell away. It fell away completely. I really wasn't thinking about it anymore. Um, and so the next stage for me was having an opportunity to um, go to a college campus. And um, my opportunities in sport, interestingly enough, for the most part, were always advanced by um, had been advanced by men. Um, I have a lot of mentors. I was fortunate that I was able to play sports. I was uh, in the conference office. There were women who were athletic directors at the time. Um, at the NCAA and national level, I saw women and minorities in sport, again, a smaller scale, but those things were um, norm for me. What wasn't um, usual was that I had men advancing my career. Um, and so Dennis Farrell was the first person who hired me at the Big West and, and then work, as I mentioned, working for all the schools and doing rules presentations. Uh, I, I did have a few athletic directors who indicated that they saw potential for me in a career in athletics. Um, so my next opportunity that I had was with Dan Guerrero, um, who was the athletic director here at UC Irvine, who just recently, a few years ago, retired as the athletic director at UCLA. And so I moved to uh, Irvine and I put these logos on here because I was at Irvine for one year. And then I transferred to UC Riverside for five years. And then, and then I had the opportunity to transfer back to UC Irvine in 2006. Um, so Dan Guerrero brought me to Irvine and gave me an opportunity to work in academics and student support services. So again, this is this is a period of time where I had my education and experience and training all in compliance and championships gave me an opportunity to come to UC Irvine and work in academics. And, and this is this is where I say the deal was sealed in, in sports for me because being on a college campus, you get to work with in bright, intelligent, talented, uh, young people. Um, you get to do it on a daily basis. You get to see them grow. You have an opportunity to, to impact their lives. Um, and you get to celebrate all of their, um, you know, trials and tribulations as well as all of their successes. And, and you have an opportunity to help shape a life and, and work through challenges and um, adversity and, and get them to um, get them to the other side, which is ultimately graduation and the next 40 years of their life and career. And so I knew that being on a, a college campus was the place that I wanted to be. As much as I enjoyed the conference office, the small camaraderie of staff, how, how much I felt like I had a seat at the table in that decision-making opportunity, um, being on a college campus um, was, really, was really the pivotal moment because you get to work with in conference, you get a championship, and that's the only time really you see student athletes. You might see them at a banquet, um, a scholar athlete uh, function, something like that, but you really get to work with student athletes on a day-to-day -day basis on a, on a college campus. And um, when I first came to Irvine and working in academics, that was never so present for me. Um, I also had uh, one of my biggest learning moments. Uh, when I came in that scenario, because I got to work with uh, students who you would classify as at risk or who received an admissions um, by exception to for their talent to be able to come into UC Irvine. And my very first uh, student I met with on a one on one basis, and we would we'd look at life skills. And we would plan what we're going to do for the week. I'd ask him to turn to his calendar section um, or his contact list, and and it was always it was always opposite. So clearly, he had uh, dyslexia as as a um, uh, an issue that he needed to work through, and I didn't understand that at the on the outset, and so. I went to my, my supervisor and said, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure how the student got into school and that I don't know that he will make it here. He's not, he's not 
following sort of my direction. He uh, is slow at sort of um, taking notes and, and listening. It wasn't focused. And, and that was my first supervisor who said uh, to me that Paula, everybody deserves an education and that you have to work with a student to realize where um, they uh, have some academic difficulties maybe, or maybe there's um, an experience that is personal that's not part of education or sport that they're bringing to campus. So there may be any number of reasons that a student might have a challenge in focusing and getting through college. And so you have to be patient and you have to work with students and you have to give them a chance and, and they, will, they will demonstrate for you, given the right resources, that they can succeed. And so um, I hunker down. I went to all the campus partners and said, hey, how do I help this student and then help build uh, and formulate our academic program and dealing with um, disability services, dealing with the counseling center um, and some of our other partners. And so that was that for me was the connection with a student that really meant that it was a rewarding work for me. It was enjoying sport that I loved, but also seeing how I could impact impact lives, um, even even young and early in my career. Um, this particular student athlete ended up being a scholar athlete for the, for the university. And so um, how, what a wonderful lesson learned in that sense that given the right resources and shaping of lives, you, you have an impact. And so um, Irvine afforded that for me for my first year. Uh, and then I transferred to Riverside um, in sport. Uh, schools transition from division three, two, and uh, up to one, and Riverside was transitioning as a division two program to a uh, division one program. And becoming a division one program came a lot with a lot of different parameters um, that the NCAA expected. You had to increase your um, academic support. You had to increase your financial support. You had to um, obviously have a certain number um, of sports that you played to be at the division one level and, and certainly fund your program to be uh, at the division one level. And so um, my next uh, career move was by uh, a basketball coach who I had to do rules presentations for, who then became an athletic director, who thought that I would also, again, be able to sustain a career in athletics. And he hired me from, from UCI to UCR. And I went there for five years and helped that institution transition to a, a division one program. Again, another piece of intercollegiate athletic sport that I was not thinking about that I would be involved in, that I would have uh, an opportunity to shape a, a school's opportunity to, to be a division one level. Um, and so I did that for five years. I worked with their um, internal services, um, their student services, their sports medicine. Um, I was able to work with uh, strength and conditioning. So I, again, was broadening my scope of my career uh, and getting a better handle and understanding um, in this business called intercollegiate athletics. Um, after five years there, um, an opportunity presented itself back at Irvine. Um, I actually applied for a job at Irvine, um, I think in 2005, and I actually did not get the job. And that was um, a little sad in, in some respects because I really loved Irvine and was hoping to have an opportunity to come back. But lessons learned in, in this career move is that um, the new athletic director at UC Irvine at the time uh, really wanted to put his own stamp on the program. And since the former staff that he replaced um, had been part of my hiring, he chose uh, to go a different direction. And so I stayed at Riverside another year, um, honing my uh, craft and trade. And then, and then a year later, um, he lost his uh, SWA and he invited me in back to have an opportunity to come back to Irvine. So again, Again, just a little little patience and fortitude, I was able to come back um, to UC Irvine to um, the next stage of my career. Um, what I will say is during all of this period of time, um, how I formulated the opportunity to grow in the sport, um, get my training and education, um, was investing in myself. Um, I went to the NCAA and I did professional development. 
I joined, I volunteered uh, on NCA committees. Um, I thought that was very important work to do, uh, to give back and volunteer. And uh, you learn the business a lot more. And so I was on um, championship cabinets. Uh, as, as Christina mentioned, I was on the volleyball um, selection committee, the championship committee for that particular sport. I um, felt it was important to get into associations within the business. So I joined uh, NACTA. So getting professional development in the athletic directors association. I joined um, NACWA. This, now it's now the Women's Foundation for Sport. Um, but I joined their association again, just broadening my network, um, having the opportunity to um, serve on nominating and selecting selection committees for those um, associations. And I just I felt like it was important enough that if if growing in sport, I had to invest in myself. So those were some of the things that I did that were personal to me, um, in addition to the professional development, all of the schools and opportunities um, that the campus gave to me. So I felt like this was going to be now my career. And I have been fortunate to be in sport working in a passion that I love and enjoying it. It doesn't seem like work to me. Um, and I feel very blessed and fortunate in that regard. I can come to work for eight hours a day and then and then go to a sporting event on the nights and weekends. And, and when I get to do that, I'm actually there to support our student athletes and watch them uh, perform in their craft and trade and, and celebrate, you know, obviously celebrate all the successes that they have and also then help them when they have adversity and, and, and pick, them, pick them back up just as much as their coaches would do. And so this was, this was the turning point for me. So as I move over, um, I realized this is really what I wanted to do. Um, if I was asked that question, there were three things that came up afterwards. That would be a chef, Latin ballroom dancing, and anything in sport. As soon as I gave up, as soon as I gave up sort of that business track and I was into sport, um, I was really all into, all into sport. And uh, being a chef sounded nice, but I actually like eating more than I do cooking. Um, and then uh, Latin dancing, I just um, have always had uh, an impress in terms of uh, the stamina and the skill and, and the beauty of which ballroom dancing can be. But again, while I liked watching it, I didn't think I would obviously be a ballroom, a professional ballroom dancer. And so, um, so career, really what I want to do is anything in sport. And I really love it in higher education. Um, again, I watch sports. I watch professional sports. I don't have an aspiration for that. I love it as part of higher education. I love having the impact with uh, students and, and again, as I said, change lives. Um, clearly, clearly it wasn't necessary for, for me to be a division one or division two or three athlete in college. Um, it's about what you learn. It's about your education. It's about the time that you invest in sport. Um, for me to being in this chair as the athletic director, a lot of people would assume that I actually also coach the sport. Um, and I have not coached the sport, but I've learned enough um, of uh, the sports that we have, playing rules of sport, the industry of sport, um, enough that I could be in this chair and help lead and administer um, our athletics department. And so I was fortunate, um, as I mentioned before, to have strong women who were doing the job, although that was not something that I recognized that I was absent in having. Um, obviously, Title IX, very important. Title IX uh, being now in 50 years of 55 years of Title IX, it's, it's, it's still disappointing to see that we are in a space that we're still trying to find um, opportunities to grow minorities and women in sport. Um, while I, while I did not see a detractor for my growth and being in this industry, um, I can say that being in it now that I do see, um, what might be still a glass ceiling for, for women and minorities in sport. And so, so the motivation for me um, in remaining in this um, career of intercollegiate athletics is really to make sure that, that um, young, young girls and minorities do continue to see women and uh, minorities in, support, in sport and that they can achieve uh, this level um, uh, of their aspiration in, in sport. Um, 
it's exciting. It's exciting to see, you know, individual and team achievements. And it's exciting to be able to go to a, a postseason event and see see all the hard work and the culmination uh, coming to for a conference championship or even an NCAA championship. Um, it, again, motivating, you get to travel with teams. I, I obviously got to, I get to visit other states that I have not been to and learn a whole lot more about those states um, and and something interesting and educational about that. I have the opportunity in sport to travel with our teams and go on uh, foreign tours. And so um, it's allowing me to actually get uh, an opportunity to go international travel and learn about a new in, in a professional development, not as a, a child who lived in Germany, but in a professional setting and, and go to a foreign uh, country that I would not ordinarily have chosen to go to, but can go and learn something very uh, important about another culture and, and how, to, how, to, how that culture works and how that culture um, visits or um, intersects in sport. And so for instance, I went with our women's team to Japan. And so I'm hopeful that in the next couple of foreign tours, I'll be able to travel with our teams to some other um, pretty um, amazing international things, which is not something you normally would do if you're not an athlete playing the sport or, or coach, coaching a team. Um, so I, I get that opportunity to travel. Um, I'm also motivated um, by sort of, again, the aspiration of student successes and um, our student academic success, their athletic success, any personal um, successes that they have, and also, also in their professional and career um, development. And so, again, just being able to work with students and impact their lives in higher education and being on a college campus um, with all all of the resources and uh, information at your fingertips to do your job. It's, it's just an exciting place to be. Um, and, and this is, this is the place that I would, I would say that I would love to continue being at a college campus. Um, number three, I would just say it's a work in process still. Um, I just landed in this chair as the athletic director. Um, I served as the interim um, for UC Irvine back in 2007 uh, for about a year, but even then I was not sure that I wanted the chair, the athletic director chair. Um, so I worked another 10 years or so um, doing craft, honing my craft and trade and um, impacting lives. And it wasn't until um, another male figure said to me, Paula, you're doing the job. You know, you, you're you doing the job and impacting lives, but being in, in chair one, you have the opportunity to impact lives and you have the opportunity to impact lives at uh, the highest level of decision-making. And so setting culture, setting, um, uh, sort of the vision and the integrity and, and the direction of, of an institution, um, you have the opportunity to do that in chair one. And so you should consider, you should really consider doing it. But I understand if, if you um, like what you're doing and you're happy with what you're doing and you're growing in your, in your job and education and assisting, assisting your department move forward, happy to stay there, but you can do a whole lot more if you consider being in chair one. So I decided to do that. And uh, that's how I got into the chair of the athletic director. Um, and it's been a whirlwind since 2019 and becoming the permanent athletic director. Um, obviously, a lot has happened in the last three years from uh, obviously the pandemic, having social justice issues, having um, uh, name, image, and likeness uh, coming forward and to the landscape of intercollegiate athletics. There's a new transfer portal um, where students have the ability to transfer and be immediately eligible at another institution. So the, the work of um, recruiting your current student athletes to stay because of the transfer portal and name, image, and likeness, and really just making sure that you're providing uh, a quality, education and experience for your student athletes. Um, that's really the key. And so that you don't have to be in this, this space of a, the transfer portal and having students um, leave unintended because their experience at your institution wasn't what it was, uh, should be. And so 
I'm focusing a lot of my time, um, both on that student athlete experience, as well as trying to assist and help my department grow. Um, I'd like UC Irvine uh, to have a, pre a premier excellence, just like UCI's campus. Um, you've mentioned some of the uh, national championships that we've won. We have conference championships, we have Olympians. Um, I wanna be in a space that I create an environment our student athletes enjoy, and they feel like their experience because of athletes athletics, in addition to graduation, um, with a high graduation success rate we have, that, that I'm providing an athletics department that um, is a pride point for the campus. We can be an open door um, and uh, a positive one for the campus, and I'd like our excellence to mirror what happens here at UC Irvine in, in teaching and research and sustainability. Um, and so I feel like my job is still in a work work in process. I just I just hit uh, another gear in, in terms of what I can do in this career of intercollegiate athletics. Um, and that's pretty exciting um, to be in that space. And so I mentioned um, some of the things that I also did. I just wanted to put this on um, this list of things on on the sheet to talk about. And this is this is scratching the surface of some of the things that I did to, to hone my career in intercollegiate athletics. Um, I, again, I volunteered on the Minority Opportunity and Interest Committee. I was on the Championship Sports and Management Committee in three different iterations. Um, I most formally was on the Division I Council, and that's a pretty impactful um, council along with the Board of Directors for the NCAA, and I served for four years on that particular um, committee. Um, I did spend some time talking about investing in myself. I did spend some time with Coro, uh, Southern California. Again, it was a program that to, to build leaders. Um, and that, um, that was a significant impact. I had to apply for a scholarship. And then I also had to finance that particular uh, venture. And it was a year long program immersing yourself into Southern California, understanding the political dynamics, the, the cities that you live in, um, how the infrastructure of your community works. Um, and so I, that was, uh, I think, a $7,000 um, uh, program that, uh, again, at the time, that was not something my institution uh, was uh, in, the, in a position to pay for. So, but that was important enough for me to, to train and do some background work in leadership and leadership opportunities um, for my career. Um, and then... Um, the big focus for me was um, in compliance because compliance touches every part of, of sport. You've really, foundationally, I think if you can get and learn NCA rules and regulations, you really can, you can be effective in your job. Um, and everybody has a shared responsibility related to being compliant with NCA rules and regulations. And so this is just a, a snapshot of some of the things that I did, um, obviously to invest in myself, uh, to further my opportunities in this career. Um, I also expressed my interest to my employers for professional development and, and then finally volunteering on a variety of committees. And so um, you just have to get in and, and enjoy sport. And so the next, the next phase that I wanted to share with you is the last of sort of where I wanted to, to wrap up why um, in, a, in a picture book of why I do sport in intercollegiate athletics. And so um, the top left photo happens to be a photo of our um, graduating seniors. Um, we have a 85% graduation success rate, um, which is on par with the campus's uh, graduation, uh, graduation rate for undergraduate enrolled um, students. Um, we give them a scholar athlete uh, sash to wear. And uh, one of the pride point moments is uh, being out on that stair step with them and taking photos um, as they have reached their culmination of their um, undergraduate education. And so that's really the key. They're students um, first before they are athletes at UC Irvine. And that's an important photo for me. Um, the lower left photo is our women's uh, team that I mentioned and our opportunity to go to Japan. Um, and again, a very wonderful educational experience. Uh, a lot of members on our team, um, much less traveling out of the state of California had never been out of the country. And so being able to uh, join student athletes and share in that kind of experience with them is so rewarding. Um, it just gives me joy to be in, in sport and being involved in something like that. The middle photo is, um, actually I'm gonna save that one last. 
if you go to the uh, far right, that is uh, our men's basketball team and winning the Big West and, and our team being able to advance to the NCAA. Again, this is what all of our student athletes hope to do is play um, for either the lower photo with our women's water polo, be conference champions and get an AQ and go to the NCAA, um, just like our men's basketball team um, winning the conference tournament and getting, getting the AQ and going to the NCAAs. And if you're lucky enough, um, you know, depending on your sport, um, men's basketball has 358, you know, institutions um, who play basketball, uh, Division One, and and if you're lucky to be that last team standing, what an amazing opportunity um, that so few get, um, and so few get an opportunity in sport, and and it's just. Um, to see all those smiles on their face that that shows the success, whether it's academic or athletic or even personal development um, is a touching part of my career and what's make what makes me get up every single day and come into work. And while there may be uh, challenges, it still is the best job ever. I, I'm happy to get up and come to work every single day. Um, and I just love sports and I can't imagine doing anything other than that. And then the peak of what you can do um, beyond sort of changing lives and the experiences that you might have is obviously getting to go to the Olympics. I have not been able to do that just yet, but I get to hold an Olympic medal because our coaches or our athletes come back with it. So you get a little, get a little feel of that or you get to narrative of their story but the middle photo happens to be um uh the opportunity when you win a national um championship title and that is um if you're lucky you'll get an invitation to go to the white house and so this is our men's volleyball team uh who had won uh an NCAA championship and was invited to the White House. Um, and this happened to be when um, George Bush was in uh, presidency. We won another one after that, and the, but I did not get the opportunity to go visit Barack Obama. I wish I had, but we did not. He invited uh, just a few sports um, that particular year, but that was not a year that we got to come back. But then he came to Irvine, right, and did uh, um, um, visit us for our graduation and, and gave, was a keynote. So again, these are just sort of uh, wonderful moments that um, sport affords. And, and I'm just, I find myself lucky to be in sport and uh, I have not looked back. And so again, I'm in this chair as the athletic director for all of these um, pivotal moments in my career. And um, there's a lot to do um, at being an athletic director, but, you know, I'm happy to share some of those and uh, can follow up with uh, anyone who has an interest on sort of the day-to-day -day kinds of things that I do. But, but that is my journey and, and how um, I came to love sport and how I came to love and be in this chair as the athletic director. So I will stop there and um, give it a little time. I think we have I think I left at least 10 minutes, maybe for a little Q&A, if there happens to be any questions. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna um, stop sharing. And so I can get back to seeing everybody's wonderful face. Awesome. I have a question. Uh, hi, Paula. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan McNichols. I'm the president of the, of the Black Management Association. So thank you for being here this evening. Uh, what I wanted to circle back and touch on uh, a topic that you brought up was um, NIL. Mm -hmm. um, Myself currently right now, I coach AAU basketball. Um, one of our kids currently actually plays for UCI. And um, from that standpoint, we know that NIL has come into the landscape and it's been very um, confusing of, of since, like no one really knows, but I know that that's been a tactic for schools trying to recruit kids and retain kids. Um, how has it impacted your day to day and impacted you as athletic director as now you know what used to be you can go in and offer someone a scholarship it's like now it's that other side of it what yes. else can you offer me yeah gosh so for me um the impact it's i thought it was going to be pretty like every, the all do do in a nil and nothing else for a long period of time we um established a name image and likeness committee and so I have several members that are on campus that have joined me on that particular committee to kind of discuss where are we shaping at UC Irvine with the use of the name image and uh, marks uh, as well as the athletics department's uh, marks and name um, and then so we can formulate what's the right decision what's the right decision related to UC Irvine or, or UC Irvine athletics 
um, going out and trying to assist in finding deals for student athletes. And, and if you're going to do that, how do you do that across the board for both male and female student athletes and not just, a, um, you know, your marquee player and, and not really looking broadly of how you're going to do that um, opportunity um, and whether or not Irvine wants to be in that space of doing it on behalf of student athletes, yet also not be left behind if other institutions um, are doing it greatly. It's, it's, it's something that I'm still evaluating for two reasons. One is while best intention to help student athletes um, uh, increase their income or compensation, it is making it sure that you have all the, all the nuts and bolts in place to really um, educate your student athletes. Because one is, is it a risk and liability to broker a deal or suggest a deal, and then it not be the deal that the student athlete had hoped for, or they didn't get as much as they were, um, you know, thought they, they would good. And so, so is it a risk for the institution to do this and then uh, perhaps be sued because, because you're right, I didn't, I didn't broker the, the right deal for you and uh, the best deal for you. And so while, while there's that caution, you know, you don't want to not do anything because, because of the the fear that something may go wrong with that. I The main thing for us has been trying to educate our student athletes in name, image, and likeness. This is your brand, this is your identity. You need to know that it's all parts. Before you sign a contract, before you accept a deal, what do you need to know in tax laws? What do you need to know in contracts? What do you need to know in um, you know the length of the deal, the agent you might get, all of these things. And so we've been spending a lot, a uh, lot more time trying to educate our student athletes and what name and intellect is, is about making sure that they um, are establishing their brand and, and why you want to establish a brand and stick with it. And so we actually have been speaking with uh, Paul Mirage School of Business on some opportunities to do um, either sort of a name, image, and likeness entrepreneurial class, sort of a freshman orientation seminar. That's one thing we want to do. We want to broaden sort of a sports um, uh, panel and communication opportunity for students, students, not just student athletes, because the truth is, it's esports who want to use name, image, and likeness. And depending on the student, you might find a recreational student and they all want access to use the facilities. They want to use the name, image, and likeness. So that's why we kind of grew the committee because I didn't want it to just be, it's all about intercollegiate athletics. It really does involve other, other groups. And so my, um, my next role is really trying to figure out um, where Irvine sits with regards to the impact of losing kids and having our students transfer or recruited away because of name, image, and likeness, or are we getting left behind in the recruiting world because we are not offering the deals which students may see or be able to achieve at another school. And all of this evaluation is being done also by looking at NCAA enforcement and am I really brokering name image and likeness deals where it is um, compensation for an action for a service for a job or or is this just another manufacturer of a way to get cash in students hands which is an impermissible side of business and so so really there's there's a lot of work in the enforcement side to make sure that that um any of the things that we do would not put us in front of the NCAA enforcement because we are actually um, just transferring uh, payment endorsements and um, inducements to students that we weren't supposed to be paying that we shouldn't be paying because it is it is about um, uh, the opportunity to gain income from your a deal that you're doing you're posting it you're you know uh, um, uh, advertising a product, you're doing something for it. It's just still not cash in hand. And so, so really those are all the things just in this last um, probably year that I've been um, having to address on a day-to-day -day basis related to name, image, and likeness. Um, and we are, we are at the beginning stages of just trying to um, hear interviews from committees or companies that want to have access to, and what are you, what is your service? Who do you serve? 
Do you do it um, for men and women? Um, and trying to look rapid, uh, whether or not they're reputable before we would put them on. We're kind of like a, a one cheater. Here, here's some opportunities, and and hopefully you can go and uh, advance your name, image, and likeness. But giving you the education sites, the things, and all that you need to be aware of, um, so that you get the best deal, and putting you in front of lawyers and things like that you need to have. So. I hope that uh, sort of gives you an idea where Irvine is at this point in time, and um, we're probably not as aggressive as some of the other institutions, but we certainly um, support name, image, and likeness, and we want our students to have the same opportunities at other schools. And, and really being in the state of California, that's the other piece that we have to be mindful of, because I think the state of California's um, uh, law actually allows for them to have agents, which is still not permissive by NCA, but we need to make sure we educate and train and our students are informed so that they don't jeopardize their eligibility. Fantastic. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Hi, Paul. I have a question. Um, you spoke a little bit about the glass ceiling with women in this industry, specifically women of color as well. Are there any initiatives out there that are being talked about to break this glass ceiling or anything you're doing differently um, in your day to day to try to help with this? Yes. So um, the NCAA is still looking at, um, while I started with uh, an internship for minorities and women in sport. The NCAA um, is looking at a couple of things they're making institutions do. They are requiring a um, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, review, which means you have to do this uh, once every four years. So ultimately every student athlete, if they're in for your four years, will have had um, an institution go through a review. And the intention is it's the same as um, having an evaluation of uh, how you operate and making any changes um, if necessary, if, where your, your shortcomings are in your diversity, equity, or inclusion. Um, the NCA is also looking at um, similar to a title called senior woman administrator. Um, it's the highest ranking female on staff that is designated. It's not what you hire for. It's just, you know, it's a designation that gives you sort of the voice and seat at the table. Um, the NCAA is also looking at um, mandating that there be a uh, diversity uh, position or staff or a designee within the athletics department. And so um, while I appreciate the senior woman administrative title and um, sort of this um, minority um, or diversity uh, designation, Again, I'm at a space that, you know, we should be past having to designate people that should be what we're doing. And so the things that um, that I'm trying to continue to do at within my athletics department is um, in the space one of training and training and education. So like I've asked my staff to do um, the unbiased uh, training. I am through my hiring, I uh, am requiring that any hiring managers also do unbiased training so that they can um, make sure that they aren't bringing all, we all bring biases to the table, but can we recognize this and set them aside and have, have really good um, diversified candidate pool so that the best candidate that we can hire is inclusive of all that have the experience to do the job. And so some of the other things um, actively is advertising. So again, not just sitting back and waiting to see what's in the pool, but being intentional about where our advertising is and um, advertising in the Women's uh, Sports Foundation, for example, advertising, I reach out to my, I'm, uh, obviously being an athletic director, there's a Black 80s Alliance. And so I would I would submit um, jobs or postings to different organizations and groups and say, hey, look, I'm hiring and I really do uh, wanna have a, a really good candidate pool. And so can you share? Can you share this information? Not only can you share it, I'm, I'm actually asking, can you identify individuals who, who you think would be good that I can get in, to get in our pools um, to, to make sure that when we have opportunities um, at UC Irvine or in, in Big West is the same, in it, Big West Conference, that we really um, have the opportunity to hire the most qualified candidate that is a, diver, of a diversified pool. And so um, the Big West also has a um, Big West Undivided and so we all collectively come to the table and share um, the good things that are happening at all of our um, other campuses. And so we can model some of those success stories 
at UC Irvine. So a lot of it is um, really just being intentional, um, creating creating a space that um, creating a space that Irvine can emulate that this is a good place to work and and a diverse um, a diverse staff is is will allow you some success and how to celebrate how to celebrate those successes. And so I'm going to take advantage of those things that are coming across the table from the NCAA, but I'd like to be in a space that um, it's what we do. It's, it's not having to be legislated to do. Um, and so I'm also um, taking opportunities to, um, for example, we are broadcasting majority of our streaming, the majority of our games during COVID, we were able to do that so that fans could see, but I'm taking opportunities um, like that this coming week um, at the Big West Basketball Tournament to actually uh, get on uh, some radio spots and uh, TV spots to talk about. And that's one of the things that I wanna highlight with regards to advancing um, diversity and equity and inclusion and, and highlighting Irvine. So thank you. I appreciate the question, Christina. And last question, I know we're at our time, but yes. um, you were talking about doing radio spots. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how you prepare for all of the PR that you end up doing. So I have, well, my, my assistant Kiana helps a little bit. So, um, and I would say my staff, um, one of the individuals who's, um, happens to be listening in today is Phil Wong. He's part of my senior staff. The truth is, um, I, I receive my content from, from my staff. I have a media relations director who um, does a phenomenal job of um, sending me sort of a recap of where we're at uh, for the week with my sports teams, um, does our year in review. Um, Phil would give me sort of uh, sort of the highlights and how we're doing, um, whether it's um, uh, attendance at games, um, sort of our, our pretty neat um, statistical information that we could have, and then and then I really spend the time trying to learn about my um, learn about my team, learn about you know um, the student athletes and the success stories that I have of my student athletes, and so who's who's graduated, what are they what are they doing when they come back um, as alumni days, getting to know them, what their careers are in. Um, the truth is because that's what people want to hear. So can I get on a, a television spot? And tell you about um, the doctor who, you know, served uh, my student athlete, you know, when a student athlete served my sister who was having um, uh, surgery and walks in the room and, and I address him as John. And then I realize, I'm sorry, you got your education that it's not John anymore. It, it's Dr. Stellar, like, you know, and giving him due respect for his career, but, but really just getting to know um, my organization. And I have a talented senior, senior staff team that really helps me continue to, to understand all of the highlights and successes that we do and what we can share. And so preparation would be just gathering that information from my team. That is an amazing team that, um, you know, I don't, why, why I do it is really about forwarding uh, my institution and, and they gave me, they give me the content to be able to do it. So, well, gosh, well, thank you so much. I appreciate everybody's attendance today. And again, I, I would invite any of you to reach out to me um, individually. Again, I hope that you enjoyed sort of just my journey, but if it's more about specific of the chair of the athletic director and sort of the things that I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm happy to uh, share anything more with you. Please uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, directly by email and, and we can connect. And, and if you'd like to come to UC Irvine athletic event, any one of our ticket events, again, I invite you to enjoy that too and just reach out and make sure that you um, come and have a good time.